Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Dom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get to the show, I'd like to take a couple of minutes of your time and ask for a little bit of support. The show has been brought to you for a while now by the supporters on Patreon. I know how important the show is to a lot of people and how valuable they find it, and those supporters who have the means to help fund it, to keep it going, and help me to reach new audiences are very much appreciated. So if you listen to Sleepy Time Tales regularly to help you deal with insomnia, and you have the urge to support the show, and most importantly, if you have the means and can afford it, please check out patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, or go to the link in the show notes or from the website to take a look. Thanks go out this week to Moya, who signed up to the Patreon. Moya's partner is Chris, who is already a patron, and the two of them listen to the show together, which is something I just absolutely adore. So thanks very much to you, Moya, and to Chris for finding the show and sharing it with you. But if you're somebody who may be backing regularly is a little bit much, there are a couple of other options as well. If you're more inclined to make a once-off contribution, then take a look at buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales, which is also linked in the show notes. And there you can buy me a coffee without even needing to sign up. I also got a contribution this week from Nadine, who threw some much appreciated funds in the tip jar. I'm grateful to all the supporters who have the ability to provide some financial backing, because I have lost a few patrons recently, mostly for financial reasons. I'm very grateful to you, those of you who have provided the support. Times are hard, and I wouldn't want this to take priority over more immediate needs. So I'm thankful to all of you who have given anything ever of any length of time. But while money is handy, another huge way is to simply spread the word. If there is someone else in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you. That's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. And of course, I've got to shout out the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends by Komiko. The music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com. That's loyaltyfreakmusic.com. I've linked their website in the show notes as they've got some very cool stuff that's released under different names that I recommend taking a look at. As an aside, if you're in a creative field, if you've got your own podcast or YouTube video or something coming, they produce their stuff as under Creative Commons available public domain stuff. So if you're needing music, it's a very cool bunch of options there for you to check out. Um, And that's enough of that. Thanks for taking the time. Let's get back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Town Tales? What is it for? This strange idea? This podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, with your mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night. Or maybe sometimes background noise or even company. That's why I make these episodes quite long, so that I'm here for you without the pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, I need something to focus on. A story or an event that lets me keep my mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties. 
to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for me. Some people might see something different, something more just like background noise. Some people may like white noise or the sound of the ocean or wind in the trees or for maybe some people it's just some boring dude droning on in the background. However you engage with it though, it is important that you don't force sleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and allow sleep to come for you. Now I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night, the odds are pretty good that this won't work for you. I suggest giving it a good three nights of a try just to see if it sinks in, if it works for you, or if maybe it's just not for you. It's also possible that one episode just isn't long enough. Because maybe the problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe your problem is waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me, is to let the podcast run all night. I have a playlist of the shows that I listen to, and I start with the latest episode, and I just let them go. That way, when I inevitably wake up at 3am and find myself staring at the ceiling, I just pop my earbuds back in and I carry on. Go straight back to sleep. Sometimes even I wake up like 30 minutes or 60 minutes before my alarm goes and I do the same thing. Pop those earbuds back in because the odds are they've fallen out and go back to sleep again. And it may sound strange to you to even bother why go to sleep when there's so little time left. But I've got to tell you that that can be the most restful part of my night. I've even had people thank me for making that suggestion because it's a uh, Sort of not logical, but it really does actually work out quite well for some people, maybe not for everybody. It's very important though that you try to relax, because I'm here to work with you, to help you to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Tonight we return to Women's Work in Music by Arthur Elson, and we pick up in Chapter 2, Medieval. Examples of still another style in the work of the Minnesingers are almost surely a direct imitation of the work of the Trevair of northern France. These examples consist of more or less lengthy fables or sometimes tales with a pleasing moral attached. Many stories of Roman history are found among these, and many of the proverbs which we use without thinking of their authorship date from this time. Among the latter are, Set not the wolf to guard the sheep, Never borrow trouble, The king must die and so must I, and many other such gems of wisdom. In all this the woman had some share, if they did not play so important part as their sisters in France. Their position as hostesses or as the objects of poetical tribute enabled them to comment and criticize. And if they did little actual composing, they were allowed to make take a prominent part in the performance of music. We find in the old books of rules and codes of education that the women of rank and position were possessed of many accomplishments, if not exactly those that are expected day to day. One of these codes, or Essenharmon, as they were called, gives the four chief duties of women, and, making allowance for the change in civilization, they correspond fairly well with those already quoted from the present German empress. The cooking and sewing remain the same, but instead of amusing the children, the women were expected to care for children of a larger growth, by obtaining a knowledge of surgery. The Chatelaine was supposed to take full charge of her lord if he returned wounded from the tourney or battle. Instead of church matters, the final accomplishment was the secular game of chess. Another work of the time gives rules of behavior for women, inculcating a submissive demeanor that is hardly practiced today. The usual modesty of deportment was prescribed. 
women were always to direct their glances discreetly downward, and in the case of a stranger were to speak only when addressed. If a room were full of women, and a man should suddenly enter, the rules of decorum compelled them to rise immediately and remain standing until he should seat himself. The extent of knightly devotion to women in the age of chivalry can hardly be exaggerated. The works of Ulrich von Lichtenstein, for example, in his Fraudenist, is full of the most absurd performances which any sensible lady would have been justified in repudiating. The troubadours indulged in even greater vagaries, and one Pierre Vidal, in love with a certain Louvre de Panatier, whose first name meant She-Wolf, adopted the name of Loup, and actually assumed a wolfskin as his garment. To prove his sincerity even more, he insisted upon being completely wrapped in this hide, and hunted by hounds and horsemen. After the dogs had caught him, he would not allow them to be pulled off, but insisted upon enduring their attacks for the glory of his lady love. When nearly dead, he was rescued and taken to her castle, where he recovered health, if not mental balance. More noble than any of these was the tribute paid to women by the menacing Henry of Maison. Declining to single out any one fair muse, he sang of womankind as a whole, and never ceased to praise their purity, their gentleness, and their nobility. Through his life he was honoured by them with the title of Frauenlob, praise of women, and at his death they marched in a funeral procession, and each threw a flower into his grave, making it overflow with blossoms. The royal house of Swabia did its best to encourage the art of the Minnesingers, allowing them a liberty of criticism that would ordinarily be undreamt of in court life. It is in an epoch little later than this that we find a singer expressing one of his objections to royalty in the following verse. King Rudolf is a worthy king, all praise to him be brought. He likes to hear the masters play and sing, but after that he gives them naught. The rise of the troubadours is due wholly to oriental influences. There may have been some native poetry among the pastoral races of the sunny land of Provence where the guild flourished, but not a single line of it remains to us. Moreover, it is certain that the eastern minstrels left their impress in Spain, and that the Crusades brought them back from the Orient, among many other novelties, the custom of encouraging minstrelsy. The Arabian bards sang chiefly of love, as well they might in a land where female loveliness received such excessive worship. At the Saracenic courts the bards were ever ready to win gratitude, and even more substantial rewards, by praising the latest favourite at the expense of former beauties. Provence, with its dazzling sun and glowing climate, possessed a striking resemblance to the eastern countries, and among its inhabitants were many who could boast an oriental ancestry. No less than five times did Saracen emirs lead their hosts into the country, endeavouring to overcome it, not only by force of arms, but by the more peaceful and more certain method of introducing their own industries and customs. Provence itself was a land of peace and repose, and could better encourage gentler arts than the warlike nations of northern Spain. We may find the troubadours definitely established there at the early part of the 12th century. The language of their songs is the beautiful Lang Dok, so called from the use of the word Oc to mean yes, and thus distinguished from the Lang d'oil of northern France and the Lingua de Si of Italy. The Langue de Oc was spoken in the entire southern part of France and has given its name to a province of the present. So when the nobles of Provence in the lordly retirement of their ancestral castles sought an entertainment suited to their refined and sympathetic natures, they were soon imitated by the greater part of the nation. The songs of the troubadours were in many cases taken directly from the eastern models. In early Arabian times it was customary for two shepherds to converse in music by intoning responsive phrases on their flutes. 
and it soon became customary for two minstrels to sing in like manner. In the early songs of the Bible too are many verses whose second half answers the first, and in fact the Hebrew words for answer and sing are said to be identical. Among the troubadours, this species of musical dialogue took the form of detention or contention. The use of answering couplets in solo songs is another point of resemblance. Another favourite Arabian form was the Qasida, or stanza constructed with only one rhyme, and the rich and melodious Provençal tongue lent itself excellently to poems of this structure. So successful were the troubadours in using it, that sometimes their compositions were over a hundred lines in length. The short but brilliant Arabian lyrics, called mucha, or embroidery, were well imitated by dainty and sparkling lyrics of the troubadours. The oriental morning song became the plan, or dirge. The evening tribute of the Arabian minstrels to their chosen loves became the serenade. While the troubadours went still further in this vein, by originating the Obad, or morning song. Among the other forms used, the verse was merely a set of couplets. The chanson was divided into several stanzas, while the sonnet was much freer in form than at present. When more than two singers took part in attention, it became a tournament. The servente was a song of war or politics, sometimes satirical, sometimes in praise of the exploits of a generous patron. The sixteen contained six stanzas of six lines each, with the rhymes holding over from one stanza to the next, and occurring in a different order in each stanza. The rhymes in this event differed from what we consider correct, but consisting always of a repetition of the same word. The discord was a sort of free fantasia, sometimes in several dialects. The pastoral was of a pastoral character, usually consisting of short lines and containing a dialogue. Among the more narrative forms are found the ballad, more especially favoured by the trouvère, or minstrels of the Langdoil regions. It gave rise to the various metres used in the epics, and sometimes formed the basis of these longer works. In general, the trouvère devoted themselves to fiction and story while their southern brethren sang of love. The novel, used largely in the south, was a short poem containing some brilliant anecdote of gallantry, couched in each phrase. The romance, or long narrative, was by reason of its size the most permanent of all the poetry of this age. Though written by both troubadours and trouvères, the latter were far superior in style and invention, and is mostly their work which has survived. These romances were sometimes in prose, but more often in poetry of extremely smooth and flowing metre. The romances grouped themselves in three principal cycles. First, the Carlovingian, including the stories of Charlemagne, of Roland and the Twelve Peers, of Fierabras, and so on. Second, the Arthurian, dealing with the legends of the Round Table. And the third, the Alexandrian, containing tales of antiquity, chiefly of Alexander the Great. In the first group, Brut d'Angleterre contains the mythical story of all the early English kings. It was adapted from Lower Brittany by Robert Wace. A Saxon trouvère continued this to his own time, imbuing his work with thorough hatred of the Normans. Walter Mapp, Archdeacon of Oxford under Henry II, wrote many Arthurian tales, while Chrétien de Troyes wrote the greater part of Sir Percival de Gaulle in Norman French. The Florient and Florite is another Arthurian tale, while Orcasine and Nicolette, of unknown authorship, is a charming romance of love in southern France and captivity among the Saracens. The life of the troubadour forms a pleasing picture in the book of medieval history. He was essentially a gentleman by birth, scorning to take pay for his songs, and often distributed the gifts he received among his servants. 
he had to maintain a large retinue and give sumptuous entertainments, with the result that he often used up his entire patrimony. The usual course in such cases was a trip to Palestine with the Crusaders, and a gallant death in battle with the infidel. But before reaching that end, his career must have been decidedly pleasant. He would pass the winter in his castle, training himself in feats of arms and in musical composition. At the advent of spring, he would issue forth, followed by a train of jongleurs singing his songs, and proceeded through field and wood to the nearest castle. Here in the evening a great feast would be arranged, with a jongleur in a special minstrel's gallery. Next day there would be music on the ramparts, or in fair weather brocade carpets would be spread in the meadows, and knights and ladies would listen to more songs. Here the troubadour himself at times deigned to perform, thus affording his hearers an unusual privilege. Here too the women had a chance to show their own skill, for there were no women travers. There were plenty who were well able to hold their own in the shorter forms of the troubadours. That kings and princes did not disdain to become troubadours is proved by the example of Richard of England and the Dauphin of Auvergne. But it is more unexpected to find a queen amongst their ranks, and that no less a queen than Eleanor, wife of Henry II of England. Her grandfather, William of Poitou, was one of the earliest patrons of the art, and she inherited his tastes. Her career, like his, is one of boldness and adventure. When wife of Louis VII, before her marriage with Henry, she set an example to chivalry by going to the Crusades with that French king, and not in the capacity of wife, but rather as an Amazon warrior. She gathered around her a troop of kindred spirits, and equipped in the most graceful array that armourers and milliners could devise, started off at the head of her husband's knights. Her campaign was conducted on principles of pleasure rather than of strategy. In Asia Minor, where she led the van during the march, she chose a route according to the beauty of the landscape rather than safety of position, and more than once brought the army into grave danger. She varied the monotony of the advance by several romantic love episodes, notably with a young emir in the train of Sultan Nureddin. She conducted a career in much the same style as the light opera heroine of today, who pauses in the midst of the action to sing a song, pursue an amour, or bask in the favour of all beholders. Chief among her admirers was Bernard de Ventador, whose verse has received high praise from the poet Petrarch. Of humble birth he won the interest of the Viscount of the castle, who gave him a good education. In those days this training consisted in knowing how to be courteous and well behaved, and how to compose a song and sing it. Bernard, after exercising his growing powers on the beauties of spring, the fragrance of flowers, and the music of the nightingale, turned his attentions to the charms of the young Viscountess, which he sung with such success that one day the object of his praises, in a fit of rapture, bestowed a kiss upon him. Enraptured by this he sang his eulogies with still more boldness, until he roused the jealousy of the lord of the castle, who locked up his young spouse and drove the troubadour from the district. He took refuge at the court of Eleanor, for whom he conceived a second and more passionate adoration, and whom he followed to England. But Henry was either more indulgent or more indifferent, and no further quarrels came. The atmosphere of refinement brought into the rude life of the castle by the troubadours is more than offset by the domestic infelicity they caused. Each of these knight errants of literature was supposed to choose a lady love, and it made no difference if she was already married. Thus conjugal fidelity was at a very low ebb, while amorous intrigues were openly encouraged by what amounted to a definite system of civilization. To settle the many vexed questions arising from the state of affairs, the courts of love were formed, 
at which noble ladies decided all disputed points. Most famous of these courts was that of Queen Eleanor herself, while amongst the others were those of the ladies of Gascony, the Viscountess of Narbonne, the Countess of Champagne, and the Countess of Flanders. Disputes before these courts usually took the form of tension or contention already described. Many of the legendary accounts of the laws upon which these courts based their decisions. There are fables of knights rising in magic forests and finding scrolls attached by golden chains to the necks of fiery dragons, or the feet of fleet birds. These laws, if not applicable in our present civilization, show in the most interesting fashion how the subject of love was regarded in the 12th century. Among them are found the following startling statements. Marriage cannot be pleaded as an excuse for refusing to love. A person who cannot keep a secret can never be a lover. No one can really love two people at the same time, says one rule, but another adds, nothing prevents one lady being loved by two gentlemen, or one gentleman by two ladies. Two years was the required period of mourning for a dead lover, but such constancy may not have been demanded in the case of the living, for, according to rule, a new love affair banishes the old one completely. Lovers in those days were expected to show the most definite symptoms of their malady, for, according to law, every lover is accustomed to grow pale at the sight of his lady love. At the sudden and unexpected prospect of his lady love, the heart of the true lover invariably palpitates, and a real lover is always the prey of anxiety and malaise. Also, a person who is prey of love eats little and sleeps little. There are many maxims on the best way of keeping true love alive, and many more on the subject of jealousy. That the love of the troubadours was none too permanent is indicated by the statement, a moderate presumption is sufficient to justify one lover in entertaining grave suspicions of the other. Among the celebrated decisions is one given by the Countess of Champagne upon the question, can real love exist between married people? Basing her decision on the fact that love implies a free granting of all favours, while marriage enforces constraint, the fair arbiter decided for the negative. Another decree of wider application was pronounced by Queen Eleanor. A lover, after entreating his lady's favour in vain, sent her a number of costly presents, which she accepted with much delight. Yet even after this tribute to her charms she remained obdurate, and would not grant him the slightest encouragement. He accordingly brought the case before the court of love, on the ground that the lady, by accepting his presents, had inspired him with false hopes. Eleanor gave the decision wholly in his favour, saying that the lady must refuse to receive any gifts sent as love tokens, or must make compensation for them. The story does not tell whether the lady in question accepted the suitor or returned the gifts. The absurdity to which these laws were carried is shown by another decision of Eleanor's. A gentleman became deeply smitten with a lady who had given her love to another, but who would have been pleased to return his devotion if ever deprived of her first lover. Soon after, the original pair were married. The gentleman, citing the decision that real love cannot exist between married people, claimed that the lady was now free to reward his fidelity. The lady declared that she had not lost the love of her first suitor by marrying him, but Queen Eleanor upheld this decision cited and ordered the lady to grant her new lover the favours he desired. The troubadours at times treated subjects far different from the usual short lyrics or long romances. Many of these minstrels performed the unusual task of setting the laws in poetic form. It is not unusual to find lawyers becoming good poets, but in this case the legal minstrels drew from the codes of their native land enough inspiration for long effusions. Moral and religious precepts too were often in the form of lengthy poems. Of even greater interest to the student of old customs are the so-called Essenhalmen, 
or collections of rules for behavior for young ladies. In one of these, by Amenaeus de Escus, called the God of Love, the poet gives his counsel to a young lady in the train of some great countess. He meets her in one of her walks, whereupon she addresses him and asks for certain rules to guard her conduct. The poet, after apologetically insisting that she must know more about it, having ten times as much common sense as he has, overcomes his scruples and proceeds to pour forth much undiluted wisdom. From his verses we learn to approve of the well-known system of early rising and early retiring, with many minor points about washing, dressing, caring for the teeth and nails, and other mysteries of the toilet. Then follow rules for behavior in church, with directions to preserve a quiet demeanor and avoid improper use of the eyes or the tongue. From the church, the writer conducts his pupil to the dinner table, reciting many important details in carving, passing the dishes properly, and performing the correct ablutions. He closes this episode with the excellent advice that no harm can come from tempering wine with water. After this comes the conversation in the drawing room, and many naive methods of raising interesting discussions are suggested. Less highly gifted than the troubadours were the jongleurs, who composed their retinue. These musical jacks of all trades began as accompanists, singing the songs of their master at the castles he visited. But soon they grew numerous and independent, and occupied a station varying from that of our public entertainers to that of the humblest street musician. Nothing came amiss to them, singing, playing all instruments, dancing, imitating the calls of birds and animals, and even the juggling that has derived its name from them. In the wandering life that they led, they were often forced to take wives and children along, and thus women grew accustomed to take some part in the performances. The glee maidens were essentially an English institution, and no doubt they were more sure of courtesy and protection in that country than on the continent. They were by far the most romantic figures of the minstrel world. Often they would wander about the country alone and unguarded, braving or avoiding the dangers of the road. Sometimes their only escort was a pet dog or a goat. They rode themselves in small garments of bright colours, often adorned with silver, while on their feet were leather buskins. They were at home in the courtyards of castles and monasteries no less than in the midst of villages and towns, and mounting on some slight knoll they would entertain gentles and commoners with voice and violin. They are often introduced into the romances of early England, and many famous glee maidens are found on the pages of history. One of the most celebrated was Adeline, who lived in the time of William the Conqueror, and was successful enough to be rewarded by him with an estate. In the reign of Henry III, we find one really great figure among the glee maidens, Marie de France. She was the jongleuse of William Longsword, son of Henry II and Fay Rosamond, and he certainly deserves the gratitude of the literary world for discovering and fostering her wonderful talent. Born probably in Brittany, her life and works identified her with the English. She was familiar with the Breton tongue and also with Latin. Her first production was a set of lays in French verse that met with instant popularity throughout England. The courts of the nobles re-echoed with her praises, and ladies as well as knights were never weary of listening to her songs. Twelve of them are now in the British Museum, among them a beautiful one dealing with King Arthur and the Round Table. These works are of rare charm, no less for their pleasing style and depth of feeling than for their simplicity of expression and clearness of narrative. Her second effort was a poetical rendering of many of Aesop's fables, done either as a favour or a tribute of love for her protector. This was followed by a translation of the purgatory of St. Patrick in Ireland, taken from the Latin. 
Few of the Glee maidens were so richly gifted or so highly placed as Marie. Most of them travelled about, either alone or in the company of Glee men, and were content with more ordinary compositions. At times they were accompanied by dancing bears who went through their figures with the maidens, while the Glee men played and tripped a fantastic toe, if not exactly a light one. The existence of the jongleurs gradually undermined that of the troubadours, as the former grew more and more proficient. In the 13th century, we find Geraint Requier, often called the last of the troubadours, requesting King Alfonso X of Castile to make a definite classification of the jongleurs, entitled the best, thus preventing the indiscriminate mixing of high and low musicians in the public mind. The king made some effort to do so, but met with little success for the whole institution was gradually decaying. A more tragic fate awaited the troubadours of Provence, the home of the art. Espousing the cause of the Albigens, they used their wit with such telling effect that they brought down upon themselves the deadly hatred of the papists, and in the short but bloody war that followed, they were almost wholly exterminated in the cruel slaughter caused by the forces of religious intolerance. Don Pedro of Aragon, who came to aid his brother troubadours, met with defeat and death, and after his loss the victor started on a career of cruelty, torture and indiscriminate murder. The castles of the minstrel knights, once the home of beauty and song, were razed to the ground, and the troubadours were blotted from the page of history. Chapter 3 Wives of the Composers Among the women who have influenced music without actually creating it, none have had greater chances to use their power than the wives of the famous composers. Often they have been endowed with no inconsiderable musical genius themselves, but have sacrificed their claim to renown upon the altar of domestic duty. Sometimes in rare instances they have had the ability to perform the double task of caring for the household and continuing their own musical labours. Their story is an interesting one, and from the time of the great John Sebastian Bach, who stands as a model of domestic purity, down even to the present day, they have played a large part in shaping the musical destinies of the world. From the 12th to the 17th century is a long gap, and music underwent many changes during this period. After the passing of the minstrel nights, popular music fades out of sight. That it had an existence, however, is amply proven. The jongleurs must have continued long after their masters were stamped out, for their direct successes are with us today, and our hand organ is the descendant of their fearful and wonderful organastrum. The entire school of English national music saw its palmiest days during this epoch. Even on the continent, the great schools of contrapuntists delighted to show their skill by employing their cantus firmus, or chief part, some well-known popular song, such as L'Homme d'Arme, for example. In Germany, the mantle of the Minnesingers fell upon the guilds of musical amateurs in the growing commercial cities. Less poetic than their predecessors, these master singers, as they named themselves, often took refuge in arbitrary rules and set metrical forms that made a poor substitute for real inspiration. That there was some genuine poetic feeling and humour among them is shown by the work of Hans Sachs, the greatest of their number. He wrote many poems and plays, of which the Fasnachspieler was the most popular and the most mirth-provoking. Contrary to the version of his life given in Rob Wagner's opera, he succeeded in making a second marriage late in life, and contrary to the general experience in such cases, the marriage was a happy one. For his young wife was exceedingly proud of her famous husband, but in the actual creative work of the master singers, women played no part. Sacred music and the science of composition flourished as never before. There is an appropriate saying that old music was horizontal, while now it is vertical, and the contrast between the interweaving of parts proceeding smoothly together and our single melody supported by massive chords is aptly illustrated by the remark. 
this very interweaving led to a style of music that was extremely complex, affording chances for intellectual and mathematical skill rather than emotional fervor. It has been customary to say that this style of composition was unsuited to women, and to pass over the epoch with a casual remark that no woman composers appeared within its limits. But modern research has shown the futility of this statement. The records of the Netherlands schools are meagre, so it is to Italy that we must turn for the earliest examples of skilled women composers. The first great name is that of Madalena Casolana who was born at Brescia about 1540. Her published composition took the shape of two volumes of madrigals, issued in 1568 and 1583. Next point in time comes Vittoria Aliotti, a native of Argenta. Her magnum opus was published at Venice in 1593 under the flowery title Galanda de Madrigali for Voci. Francesca Baglionacella born at Perugia in the same century, is another exponent of the art, while Orsino Vazzani, who first saw the light of day at Bologna in 1593, not only composed many pieces in this form, but by playing her own and others' works did much to make it popular with all the music lovers in Italy. The year 1600 saw the beginning of opera, due to the work of Perry and his Florentine compeers in trying to revive the juster signs of Greece. Among the early operatic composers is found the charming and accomplished Francesca Caccini, daughter of that Giulio Caccini who was Pieri's friend and most formidable rival. Born at Florence in 1581 and educated in the most thorough manner, she was for many years the idol of her native city. Not only because of her great talent in singing and composition, but also on account of the exquisite beauty of her Latin and Tuscan poetry. Among other musical works by her, two examples of the new form, La Liberazione di Ruggiero and Rinaldo Innamorato, both of which are preserved to us. A later composer in the same field was Barbara Strozzi, whose opera De Porti de Oterp was successfully received at Venice in 1659. In Ricordi's modern collection of old Italian songs are some charming examples of her skill in other directions. In the domain of Italian sacred music, too, the women were not inactive. Caterina Sandra, at the beginning of the 17th century, wrote a number of religious works, of which Veni's Sancte Spiritus, for two voices, achieved more than passing fame. Margherita Cosolani and Lucrezia Orsini Vazana both Catholic sisters, when renowned by their motets and other sacred works. Cornelia Caligari, born at Bogamo in 1644, won the plaudits of her nation by her wonderful singing and organ playing, as well as by her many compositions. Her first book of motets was published in her 15th year and met with universal success. The highest forms possess no difficulties for her, and among her works are several masses for six voices with instrumental accompaniment. These names are enough to show that woman was able to hold her own, even in a period where music had apparently banished those emotional qualities with which she is said to be most in sympathy. The women of other countries were not idle in this period of musical activity. Germany, in spite of her meagre records, can show at least one great name. Madelka Bariona, who lived during the 16th century, upheld the musical reputation of her country by publishing seven far-voiced psalms at Altdorf in 1586. Bernarda Ferreira de la Serra was of Portuguese nationality. She won great renown by her writings and her knowledge of languages. King Philip II of Spain wished to entrust her with the education of his children, but she declined, alleging as a reason that she wished to devote all her time to study. Many of her manuscripts, compositions, and musical writings are preserved in the Royal Library at Madrid. France can boast of a real genius in Clementine de Bourges, who was born at Lyon in the 16th century. 
such authorities as Mendel and Grove accord her a rank with the very greatest of her time. She held a high position among the intellectual leaders of the day, as much by her great learning as by her musical skill. She shows complete mastery of many instruments, and her gifts in composition are amply proven by her four-part chorus, which can be found in J. Pakes's organ collection. Her career was brought to an untimely end by grief. She was engaged to Jean de Peyrat, a royal officer who met his death in a skirmish with the Huguenots in 1560. Her sorrow at this disaster proved incurable, and she died in the next year. Although the unfortunate Mary, Queen of Scots, belongs to more northern land, the credit to her talents may be fairly accorded to France, where she received her education. She made no musical attempts in the more ambitious forms, but wrote many songs, among which Las and Mon Dieu Printemp and Monsieur le Provost de Marchand met with considerable success in their day. With the advent of Bach, music was no longer the dry mathematical study that it had been during the later Middle Ages, for in his hands it became imbued with true feeling. Descended from a famous family of musicians, he was born at the little German town of Eisenach in 1685. Receiving his early education at Ondruf, he showed himself endowed with unusual genius. Forced to make his way when 15 years old, he supported himself in the convent school of St. Michael's at Lundberg by means of his musical talents. After a short term as court musician at Weimar, he became organist of the new church at Arnstadt, and here he met the woman who was to be his first wife. Among the earliest mention of her is made in a report to the consistory, criticizing the young organist for certain breaches of discipline. From this report, it appears that he had asked for four weeks' leave for study, and had stayed away four months. He had played interludes that the reverend board considered too long and too intricate, and on being reproved, he had made them too short. And once during the sermon, he had gone forth and spent these stolen moments in a wine cellar. The final charge asked by what authority had clearly allowed a strange maiden to appear and to make music in the choir. The strange maiden who made music with Bach in the solitude of the empty church was none other than his cousin, Maria Barbara. A year later, 1707, he married her and took her to Mölhausen, where he had found a less troublesome post as organist in the church of St. Blasius. The domestic life of Bach and his wife was a pattern for married couples of all time. All his friends unite in calling him an especially excellent housefather, a term of commendation applied to those men who remember their duty to their own families and do not sacrifice domestic happiness to fame and fortune. Personally, he was pleasant to everyone, mere acquaintances as well as intimate friends, and his house was always the centre of a lively gathering. With his wife, he took sedulous care of the education of his children, of whom there were no less than six at her early death in 1720. Bach was not the man to remain long a widower, and in the next year the bereaved composer's fancy lightly turned to thoughts of a second marriage. His choice fell upon Anna Magdalena Wilken, a Cothen court singer of 21 years, and the happy consummation occurred on December 3rd. She was a good musician and did much to enliven the domestic circle by her beautiful soprano voice. Not content with merely taking part in her husband's works, she learned from him to play the clavier and read figured bass, and rendered him valuable aid by copying music for him. Soon after the marriage, Bach and his wife started a manuscript music book entitled Clavier Bachlin von Anna Magdalena Bach, Anno 1720. On the first page was written a playful denunciation of the melancholy and hostility to art that was so often inculcated by the Calvinism of that time. This book and another of the kind, which followed it five years later, are both preserved in the Royal Berlin Library. 
in them are a series of clavier pieces by Bach, Gerhardt, and others, a number of hymns and sacred songs, one of several humorous songs describing the reflections of a smoker, and still others apparently addressed to his wife and giving fresh proofs of his devotion to her. Her portrait was painted by Cristofori, but disappeared after being in the possession of one of the sons. As a result of his second marriage, Bach was blessed with thirteen more children, six sons and seven daughters. All his children loved him, and his kindness and sincerity enabled him to retain their respect as well as their affection. In all his activity, he was never too busy to save some time for the family circle, where in later life he would take the viola part in the concerted music that cheered his domestic hearth. It is sad to think of the poor wife's fate in contrast with so much family happiness. After Bach's death in 1750, she struggled bravely to support her children, but became gradually poorer and was forced to end her days in an almshouse and be buried in a pauper's grave. Less happy than Bach in his married life was Franz Joseph Hayden. After a boyhood of poverty and struggles, he obtained a position as Kapellmeister to a bohemian nobleman, Count Morzin. This post was none too lucrative, however, for it brought the composer only about $100 a year, while his teaching could not have provided him with much extra wealth, and his compositions brought him nothing. Yet his financial troubles did not deter him from seeking those of matrimony, in spite of the fact that Count Morzin never kept married men in his service. According to the poet Campbell, marriage looks like madness in nine cases out of ten, and Hayden's venture was certainly no exception. The one upon whom the composer's affections lighted was the younger daughter of a barber named Keller. He had met her while a choir boy in the church of St. Stephen at Vienna, and she had afterwards become one of his pupils. For some unexplained reason, let us hope it was not because of the young composer's love, she took to the veil and renounced the wickedness and marriages of the world. The barber, possibly hoping to lighten the suitor's disappointment and very probably wishing to have both daughters off his hands, promptly suggested to the young lover that he take it the elder sister instead. Apparently realizing that marriage at his best is but a lottery, he didn't accepted the proposition. The wedding took place at St. Stephen's on November 26, 1760. Whether Count Morzin would have made an exception in Hayden's case and retained him in spite of this event, there is no means of telling. For that nobleman met with financial reverses and was forced to give up his musical establishment. Fortunately for the young genus, some of his works had been heard and admired by the Prince Paul Esterhazy, who showed his musical discernment by taking Hayden into his service and becoming a lifelong patron of the composer. And on that positive note, I think I'm going to call it a thing for tonight. If you would like to carry on and pick up where I've left off, and learn a little bit more about the woman's place in the history of music, to be frank, not much woman in it so far, um, you can find the, show, find the book at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week, but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>